Chapter 10 of Esther Waters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Abraham. Esther Waters by George Moore. Chapter 10. A group of men turned from the circular buffet when Esther entered. Miss Mary had given her a white muslin dress, a square-cut bodice with sleeves reaching to the elbows, and a blue sash tied around the waist. The remarks as she passed were, A nice pretty girl. William was waiting, and she went away with him on the hop of a vigorous polka. Many of the dancers had gone to get cool in the gardens, but a few couples had begun to whirl. The women borne along by force, the men poising their legs into curious geometrical positions. Mr. Leopold was very busy dragging men away from their circular buffet. They must dance whether they knew how or not. The gaffers told me particular to see that the gals all had partners, and just look down that ear room. Half of that lot haven't been on their legs yet. Here's a partner for you. And the butler pulled a young gamekeeper towards a young girl who had just arrived. She entered slowly, her hands clasped across her bosom, her eyes fixed on the ground and the strangeness of the spectacle caused Mr. Leopold to pause. It was whispered that she had never worn a low dress before, and Grover came to the rescue of her modesty with a pocket handkerchief. But it had been found impossible to restrict the ball to those who possessed or could obtain an evening suit, and plenty of check trousers and red neckties were hopping about. Among the villagers many a touch suggested costume. A young girl had borrowed her grandmother's wedding dress, and a young man wore a canary-coloured waistcoat and a blue coast guardman's coat of old time. These touches of fancy and personal taste divided the villagers from the household servants. The butler seemed on the watch for side dishes, and the valets suggested hairbrushes and hot water. Cooks trailed black silk dresses adorned with white collars and fastened with gold brooches containing portraits of their late husbands, and the fine shirt fronts set off with rich pearls, the lavender-gloved hands, the delicate faces, expressive of ease and leisure, made Ginger's two friends, young Mr. Preston and young Mr. Northcote, noticeable among this menial, workaday crowd. Ginger loved the upper circles, and now he romped the polka in the most approved London fashion. His elbows advanced like a yacht's bowsprit, and his coat tails flying, he dashed through a group of tradespeople who were bobbing up and down, hardly advancing at all. Esther was now being spoken of as the belle of the ball. She had danced with young Mr. Preston, and seeing her sitting alone, Grover called her and asked her why she was not dancing. Esther answered rather sullenly that she was tired. Come, the next polka, just to show that there is no ill feeling. Half a dozen times William repeated his demand. At last she said, You've spoiled all my pleasure in the dancing. I'm sorry if I've done that, Esther. I was jealous, that's all. Jealous? What was you jealous for? What do it matter what people think, so long as I know I haven't done no wrong? And in silence they walked into the garden. The night was warm, even oppressive, and the moon hung like a balloon above the trees, and often the straying revellers stopped to consider the markings now so plain upon its disk. There were arbours, artificial ruins, darkling pathways, and the breathless garden was noisy in the elusive light. William showed Esther the theatre and explained its purpose. She listened, though she did not understand. Nor could she believe that she was not dreaming when they suddenly stood on the borders of a beautiful lake, full of the shadows of tall trees, and crossed by a wooden bridge at the narrowest end. How still the water is! And the stars! They are lovely. You should see the gardens about three o'clock on Saturday afternoons, when the excursion comes in from Brighton. They walked on a little further, and Esther said, What's these places? Ain't they dark? These are arbours, where we are shrimps and tea. I'll take you next Saturday if you'll come. A noisy band of young men, followed by three or four girls, ran across the bridge. Suddenly they stopped to argue on which side the boat was to be found. Some chose the left, some the right. Those who went to the right sent up a yell of triumph and paddled into the middle of the water. 
they first addressed remarks to their companions, and then they admired the moon and stars. A song was demanded, and at the end of the second verse, William threw his arm around Esther. Oh, Esther, I do love you. She looked at him, her grey eyes fixed in a long interrogation. I wonder if that's true. What is there to love in me? He squeezed her tightly and continued his protestations. I do, I do, I do love you, Esther. She did not answer, and they walked slowly on. A holly bush threw a black shadow on the gravel path, and a moment after, the ornamental tin roof of the dancing room appeared between the trees. Even in their short absence, a change had come upon the ball. About the circular buffet, numbers of men called for a drink and talked loudly of horse racing. Many were away at supper, and those that remained were amusing themselves in a desultory fashion. A tall, lean woman, dressed like Sarah in white muslin, wearing amber beads around her neck, was dancing the lancers with the demon, and everyone shook with laughter when she whirled the little fellow around or took him in her arms and carried him across. William wanted to dance, but Esther was hungry, and led him away to an adjoining building where cold beef, chicken and beer might be had by the strong and adventurous. As they struggled through the crowd, Esther spied three young gentlemen at the other end of the room. Now tell me, if they ask me, the young gents yonder, to dance, am I to look them straight in the face and say no? William considered for a moment and then he said, I think you had better dance with them if they ask you. If you refuse, Sarah will say it was I who put you up to it. Let's have another bottle, cried Ginger. Come, what do you say, Mr. Thomas? Mr. Thomas coughed, smiled, and said that Mr. Arthur wished to see him in the hands of the police. However, he promised to drink his share. Two more bottles were sent for, and, stimulated by the wine, the weights that would probably be assigned to certain horses in the autumn handicap were discussed. William was very proud of being admitted into such company, and as he listened, a cigar which he did not like between his teeth and a glass of champagne in his hand. Suddenly, the conversation was interrupted by the cornet sounding the first phase of a favourite waltz, and the tipsy and the sober hastened away. Neither Esther nor William knew how to waltz, but they tumbled around the room, enjoying themselves immensely. In the polka and mazurka, they got on better. And then there were quadrilles and lancers in which the gentlemen joined, and all were gay and pleasant. Even Sarah's usually sour face glowed with cordiality when they joined hands and raced around the men standing in the middle. In the chain they lost themselves, as in a labyrinth, and found their partners unexpectedly. But the dance of the evening was Sir Roger de Coverley, and Esther's usually sober little brain evaporated in the folly of running up the room, then turning and running backwards, getting into a place as best she could, and then starting again. It always appeared to be her turn, and it was so sweet to see her dear William, and such a strange excitement to run forward to meet young Mr. Preston, to curtsy to him, and then run away and this over and over again. There's the dawn. Esther looked, and in the whitening doorways she saw the little jockey staggering about helplessly drunk. The smile died out of her eyes. She returned to her true self, to Mrs. Barfield and the brethren. She felt that all this dancing, drinking, and kissing in the arbours was wicked. But Miss Mary had sent for her, and had told her that she would give her one of her dresses, and she had not known how to refuse Miss Mary. Then, if she had not gone, William... Sounds of loud voices were heard in the garden, and the lean woman in white muslin repeated some charge. Esther ran out to see what was happening, and there she witnessed a disgraceful scene. The lean woman in the muslin dress and the amber beads accused young Mr. Preston of something which he denied, and she heard William tell someone that he was mistaken, and that he and his pals didn't want no rowing at this year ball, and what was more... They didn't mean to have none, and her heart filled with love for her big William. What a fine fellow he was! How handsome were his shoulders, beside that round-shouldered little man whom he so easily pulled aside, and having crushed out the quarrel, he helped her on with her jacket. 
and hanging on his arm they returned home through the little town margaret followed with the railway porter sarah was with her faithful admirer a man with a red beard whom she had picked up at the ball rover waddled in the rear embarrassed with the green silk which she held high out of the dust of the road when they reached the station the sky was stained with rose and the barren downs more tin like than ever in the shadowless light of dawn stretched across the sunrise from lansing to brighton the little birds sat ruffling their feathers and awaking to the responsibilities of the day flew into the corn the night had been close and sultry and even at this hour there was hardly any freshness in the air esther looked at the hills examining the landscape intently she was thinking of the first time she saw it some vague association of ideas the likeness that the morning landscape bore to the evening landscape or the wish to prolong the sweetness of these the last moments of her happiness impelled her to linger and to ask william if the woods and fields were not beautiful the too familiar landscape awoke in william neither idea nor sensation esther interested him more and while she gazed dreamily on the hills he admired the white curve of her neck which showed beneath the unbuttoned jacket she never looked prettier than she did that morning standing on the dusty road her white dress crumpled the ends of the blue sash hanging beneath the black cloth jacket end of chapter 10